Hi, I'm Rachel, and this is my Would You Read It Challenge for the BookTube Prize 2019 Octafinals Group B. <laughs> or maybe I should just say Would You Read It Challenge for September 2022. I don't know, I guess I should uh, normalize uh, my intros here. But anyway, uh, the Would You Read It Challenge is a BookTube tag I've co-opted from Et to Brody. Uh, the idea being that uh, you read the first sentence of a random assortment of books and then ask your audience if they'd like to continue. Uh, but I've decided that one sentence isn't enough, so I've gone for a few paragraphs. And I've been organizing it, uh, well, starting last month, I've been doing this tag to the beat of the Book 2 Prize drummer. Uh, the Book 2 Prize was started by Robert at Barter Hordes. Every year we are judging... Uh, the best written uh, literature uh, in, uh, that was published in the U.S. the year before, uh, where we um, have four rounds, uh, long lists of 48 books per division that we whittle down uh, in this current year in 2022. We are at the very end of the finals round. Uh, we are judging the very last ballots of six books per division and uh, have to get our ballots in, uh, those of us who are official judges, uh, by the end of this month so that Robert can announce the winners and runners-up uh, in early October. Uh, this year we are um, judging uh, in literary fiction, translated fiction, and uh, nonfiction. Uh, but back in 2019, in the first year, uh, it, we were only judging uh, literary fiction. Uh, and that's where I am beginning, you know, going back and uh, paying homage to this <laughs> uh, literary uh, prize for the Bookdernet community that uh, I've really been enjoying taking part in these past few years. Anyway, I'm just going back to the beginning and slowly eking my way through uh, and uh, sharing with you uh, the first few paragraphs of all of the books on uh, the long list ballots. Uh, so yes, as I've said, I am on to um, the uh, Octafinals Group 2019 Group B. Uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and uh, read the first few paragraphs of the six books and then share my thoughts on them with you. Starting with book number one, 1985. Twenty miles from here, twenty miles north, the funeral mass was starting. Yale checked his watch as they walked up Belden. He said to Charlie, how empty do you think that church is? Charlie said, let's not care. The closer they got to Richard's house, the more friends they spotted heading the same way. Some were dressed nicely, as if this were the funeral itself. Others wore jeans, leather jackets. It must only be relatives up at the church, the parents' friends, the priest. If there were sandwiches laid out on some reception room, most were going to waste. Neil found the bulletin from last night's vigil in his pocket, and folded it into something resembling the cootie catchers his childhood friends used to make on buses, the ones that told your fortune, famous or murdered, when you opened a flap. This one had no flaps, but each quadrant bore words, some upside down, all truncated in the folds. Father George H. Whitbe, beloved son and brother, Reston, all things bright and, lieu of flowers, Donatia, all of which, Yale supposed, did tell Nico's fortune. Nico had been bright and beautiful. Flowers would do no good. And that was from The Great Believers by Rebecca Mackay. Book Two. Words. Ayula summons me with these words. Corede, I killed him. I had hoped I would never hear those words again. Bleach. I bet you didn't know that bleach masks the smell of blood. Most people use bleach indiscriminately, assuming it is a catch-all product, never taking the time to read the list of ingredients on the back, never taking the time to return to the recently wiped surface to take a closer look. Bleach will disinfect, but it is not great for cleaning residue, so I use it only after I have first scrubbed the bathroom of all traces of life and death. It is clear that the room we are in has been remodeled recently. It has that never-been-used look, especially now that I've spent close to three hours cleaning up. The hardest part was getting to the blood that had seeped in between the shower and the caulking. It is an easy part to forget. And that was from My Sister the Serial Killer by Oinacon Braithwaite. Book Three. As Amar watched the hall fill with guests arriving for his sister's wedding, he promised himself he would stay. It was his duty tonight to greet them. A simple task, one he told himself he could do well. 
and he took pride in stepping forward to shake the hands of the men, or hold his hand over his heart, and to pay the women respect. He hadn't expected his smile to mirror those who seemed happy to see him, nor had he anticipated the startling comfort in the familiarity of their faces. It had really been three years. Had it not been for his sister's call, he might have allowed even more years to pass before summoning the courage to return. He touched his tie to make sure it was centered. He smoothed down his hair as if a stray strand would be enough to cause attention, give him away. An old family friend called out his name and hugged him. What would he tell him if they asked where he had been and how he was doing? The sounds of the Shanai started up to signal the commencement of Hadia's wedding, and suddenly the hall was brought to life. There, beneath the golden glow of the chandeliers, and surrounded by the bright colors of the women's dresses, Amar thought maybe he had been right to come. He could convince them all, the familiar faces, his mother, who he sensed checking on him as she moved about, his father, who maintained his distance. He could even convince himself that he belonged here, that he could wear the suit and play the part, be who he had been before, and assume his role tonight as brother of the bride. And that was from A Place for Us by Fatima Farhi Mirza. Book 4. Ma, 1952. The morning burned so August hot the marsh's moist breath hung the oaks and pines with fog. The palmetto patches stood unusually quiet except for the low, slow flap of the heron's wings lifted from the lagoon. And then Kaya, only six at the time, heard the screen door slap. Standing on the stool, she stopped scrubbing grits from the pot and lowered it into the basin of worn-out suds. No sounds now but her own breathing. Who had left the shack? Not Ma. She never let the door slam. But when Kaya ran out to the porch, she saw her mother in a long brown skirt, pleats nipping at her ankles, as she walked down the sandy lane in high heels. The stubby-nosed shoes were fake alligator skin, her only going-out pair. Kaya wanted to holler out, but knew not to rouse Pa, so opened the door and stood on the brick-and-board steps. From there, she saw the blue train case Ma carried. Usually, with the confidence of a pup, Kaya knew her mother would return with meat wrapped in greasy brown paper or with a chicken head dangling down. But she never wore high heels, never took her case. And that was from Where the Crawdads Sing by Delia Owens. Book 5. Chain night happens once a week on Thursdays. Once a week that defining moment for 60 women takes place. For some of the 60, that defining moment happens over and over. For them it is routine. For me it has happened only once. I was woken at 2 a.m. and shackled and counted. Romy Leslie Hall, inmate W314159, and lined up with the others for an all-night ride up the valley. As our bus exited the jail perimeter, I glued myself to the mesh-reinforced window to try and see the world. There wasn't much to look at. Underpasses and on-ramps, dark, deserted boulevards. No one was on the street. We were passing through a moment in the night so remote that traffic lights had ceased to go from green to red and merely blinked a constant yellow. Another car came alongside. It had no lights. It surged past the bus, a dark thing with demonic energy. There was a girl on my unit in county who got life for nothing but driving. She wasn't the shooter, she would tell anyone who'd listen. She wasn't the shooter. All she did was drive the car. That was it. They'd used the license plate reader technology. They had it on video surveillance. What they had seen was an image of the car at night moving along a street, first with lights on and then with lights off. If the driver cuts the lights, that's premeditation. If the driver cuts the lights, it's murder. And that was from The Mars Room by Rachel Kushner. And finally, book number six. I am old. That is the first thing to tell you. The thing you are least likely to believe. If you saw me, you would probably think I was about 40, but you would be very wrong. I am old. Old in the way that a tree or a quahog claim or a Renaissance painting is old. To give you an idea, I was born well over 400 years ago, on the 3rd of March, 1581, in my parents' room, on the third floor of a small French chateau that used to be my home. It was a warm day, apparently, for that time of year, and my mother had asked her nurse to open all the windows. God smiled on you, my mother said, though I think she might have added that, should he exist, the smile had been a frown ever since. My mother died a long time ago. 
I, on the other hand, did not. You see, I have a condition. I thought of it as an illness for quite a while, but illness isn't really the right word. Illness suggests sickness and wasting away. Better to say I have a condition. A rare one, but not unique. One that no one knows about until they have it. And that is from How to Stop Time by Matt Haig. Okay, and my thoughts on these books. Uh, technically speaking, I know a fair bit about most of them. I have now read four books on this Ballad of Six, including the book that came in at third place uh, in the overall Book Two prize that year, which was A Place for Us by Fatima Farhi Mirza, which I believe is maybe my favorite uh, read of all the books I've read now that, uh, you know, were contenders for this prize. Certainly it's my favorite of these six. Uh, I don't actually think, uh, you know, it's a very slow beginning. It's a slow burn beginning. So it's not, I think, the most enticing uh, start because it's so introspective, uh, but uh, it, it really was a beautiful uh, uh, story about a family and uh, particularly about this young man who uh, had been estranged and uh, at the very beginning attempted returning and then the story moves back and forth in the past and present to, you know, understand what this Muslim American family is all about. It, it was just a really wonderful book. Then my second favorite book of these was uh, probably the first one, which is uh, The Great Believers by Rebecca Mackay, which was a book, uh, another uh, dual timeline book uh, about um, uh, Yale as a young man who was uh, suffering from AIDS in uh, the 1980s. Uh, you know, you could kind of infer, I suppose, uh, from those beginning paragraphs uh, that uh, he was attending a... Uh, a vigil and a, and a service or a memorial for uh, one of his friends who died of AIDS and uh, you know the official service uh, where they weren't invited to would be sparse because of uh, the you know homophobic inclinations of society but anyway I, I found this uh, I found uh, this story to be very moving in fact it centered a lot on the caretakers of uh, people with uh, AIDS although I think the modern day storyline uh, which I believe uh, is Nico's sister, uh, the, the young man who died. Uh, it, it didn't work as well for me, uh, and I enjoyed her, this woman, a lot more in the 1980s storyline, but uh, Yale, I suppose, was uh, the bigger main character then. But uh, anyway, I feel like, I don't know, in retrospect I feel iffy, but I remember just uh, really uh, falling uh, and really liking this story a lot when I read it uh, back then, although I also I still didn't like the uh, modern day story as much. Maybe I'll skip briefly to uh, the uh, two books I haven't read on this ballot, which I guess I'm still not quite uh, into. Uh, like, uh, even My Sister the Serial Killer, which, technically speaking, this was a pretty compelling start, right? I mean, you know, it's <laughs> obviously uh, meant to draw you in with all this external stuff about, you know, killing people and cleaning up a crime scene and that sort of stuff. And it, So I could see how uh, that's compelling. I just, I guess I have my own biases about, you know, murder and taking myself too seriously and that sort of thing. So I don't know if this uh, book is really for me. And then How to Stop Time by Matt Haig is the second book I haven't read, which again isn't, I, it's that sort of literary speculative fiction that I think isn't quite for me uh, because uh, I guess it eschews some of the things I like most about both literary and uh, science fiction <laughs> and feels like, I don't know, this whole idea of, uh, you know, living forever or having a condition, I, I, I'm not sure that really intrigues me very much, you know. <laughs> I mean, I can see how, you know, on that topical level, it's always very interesting to hear about a character who's been alive for 400 years, I suppose, but I, I, I don't think... Uh, the uh, themes, uh, I don't know, the whole immortality thing doesn't really work for me, and then when you just get back to literary fiction, why can't you just have a normal person, <laughs> you know, and uh, uh, interrogating their lives, I don't know, <laughs> that's where I am with that. So uh, finally, I guess uh, my least two favorite books I've actually read are The Mars Room and uh, Where the Crawdads Sing. Uh, and I feel kind of bad about saying where the crawdads sing. I feel like I'm very alone in that. You know, I, I found the story to be just a little too uh, melodramatic, I suppose, is a, the, the proper term for it. Kaya was a little too much of a stereotypical sort of victimized character for me. And I don't know, the questions that we were asking about her culpability in this uh, murder case uh, I, I didn't jive well with me. But one thing that I think people really fall for hard is the beautiful descriptive writing about the marsh and uh, where she lives, and uh, that certainly was on display in these first few paragraphs. 
And then finally with The Mars Room by Rachel Kushner, which takes place in a women's prison. Uh, I liked it. Oh, uh, I liked it when I read it, uh, but I do feel like I, I remember that the ending felt a little too abrupt to me. But I guess overall, I think uh, I, maybe I liked it uh, more than some other people. I know uh, S Steve Donahue, I think, uh, disliked it enough to put it on his uh, least favorite uh, fiction list of that year. Uh, but uh, I feel like I guess I, I did like it well enough, although I remember the ending being a little disappointing. So there we have it. Anyway, I read three of these books kind of unofficially as an unofficial judge back in 2019 and made a video comparing and contrasting them, uh, those three books being uh, The Mars Room, uh, The Great Believers, and A Place for Us. So I will link to that uh, video down below. And then I have since read Where the Crawdads Sing with uh, my mom and auntie's book club a little while ago. Uh, so that's why I've read four books on this ballot. Uh, and I actually also recently uh, watched the movie adaptation uh, that uh, came out this summer. So uh, and reviewed that as well uh, in an adaptation way of like trying to compare and contrast to the book kind of. So I will go ahead and link uh, that uh, blog post down below as well. And that about covers it for me now. I wanted to take a moment to thank people who reached out to me about the recent uh, death of my cat. Uh, she died, Missy died, a little under a week ago. Uh, she'd been suffering from terminal cancer and her condition really rapidly deteriorated last weekend. So I had opted for that end of life uh, care so she could go with uh, as much dignity as she could. Uh, anyway, it's still been very hard, especially uh, you know, she was seven years old and uh, the cancer came on quite suddenly five months ago, like in bits and spurts. Uh, uh, anyway, it's still been quite hard and I appreciate uh, the support. Uh, I'm lucky to get support from family and friends outside of Booktube as well. Uh, for example, I live in the DC area, but I've been in a lot of contact with my aunts in Kansas and uh, uh, while this was going on, the hospice situation, uh, and since uh, Missy passed, uh, they've been sending me a lot of photos, uh, you know, you know, blowing up uh, photos that I, you know, texted to them uh, in uh, the last month of her life. Uh, so it's always uh, nice to have those mementos around. And speaking of which, uh, I have a lot of footage of Missy on my channel here, so I am hoping uh, later this weekend to uh, put together a, a video in honor of her uh, with those uh, some snippets from that. Uh, and then in a more conventional booktube capacity, uh, you can um, expect me back on this channel uh, in, within a few uh, days of that uh, to do my uh, latest AM reading video. So yeah, stay tuned. Thanks so much for watching everyone, and I'll see you next time.